1840s, the United States gains more than a million square miles of new territory, the greatest wave of expansion since the Louisiana Purchase nearly 40 years earlier. Much of the land is annexed in a struggle between the United States and its neighbor to the south, Mexico. On the eve of the Civil War, in the 10, 20 years before that, the United States is talking about expansion, manifest destiny. It is America's responsibility and role in the world to people the nation, to people the continent, and bring the great benefits of Anglo-Saxon culture and capitalism and security uh, to the supposed heathens, uh, Mexicans included, but Native Americans too, across the continent. One of the problems that American historians face if they try to explain something like manifest destiny, which is a, which is a concept I have a great deal of doubt about, and Texas is a good example of why I have so much doubt about it. Supposedly, Americans were willing to expand and thought they were destined to expand across the whole continent. Texas, certainly with the encouragement of the American government, breaks off from Mexico. And then it begins to apply to become a state in the Union. And it's turned down once. It's turned down twice. It's turned down three times. And the reason it's turned down is because not all Americans are convinced that, in fact, they want Texas. And they don't want Texas because they don't want to add slave territory. To set the stage, in the early 1820s, Mexico made an effort to colonize the territory now known as Texas with little success. There was a statement popularized by an Argentine writer at a later date, but it was uh, gobernar es poblar, which means to govern is to populate. And first the Spanish government, later the Mexican government said, well, one of the ways of stopping American expansion is by colonizing our northeastern border, which would be, of course, the obstacle. Well, they had a terrible time getting other Mexicans to want to go up and live up in Texas. It was just too distant from Mexico City. It was away from civilization. You know, the weather was terrible. It was a bad place to go. When Mexico became independent, one of the early debates in the Mexican Congress is, what do we do? We can't get our own people to colonize it. Should we or should we not let Americans colonize it? And by a fairly narrow margin, after tremendous debate, they finally decided, we think we can take a risk. We can bring American colonists in if they will pledge their loyalty and agree to learn Spanish and become Mexican citizens, and they can provide a buffer. As it turned out, they rolled dice wrong. They made a mistake. A young immigrant from Missouri establishes the first legal American settlement in Texas in 1822 and begins to attract others to the region. As their numbers grow, tensions between the settlers and the Mexican government flare up from time to time and finally explode in 1835 when the settlers defiantly proclaim independence from Mexico. The Mexicans retaliate. They said the Texans had accepted uh, loyalty to Mexico when they settled there. So this was a treasonous act, and of course Mexico sent troops to try and quell it. Um, it was not a very good army that Mexico sent up. Santa Ana, who led the army, was recruiting farmers, pulling them off their farms, putting them in uniforms. So when they got there, even though it was a large army, it was not a terribly well-trained army. As a result, even though the Texans were outnumbered, they were a more experienced force uh, than the Mexicans they faced. Mexico never recognized Texas independence as far as they were concerned. They were just a split-off province who sooner or later they would get back. Most of the people who settled Texas are from the southern tier of states. And most of the settlers very much wanted to be a part of the United States. It was officially annexed in the mid-1840s under the administration of James Polk, who was a protege from Tennessee of his great mentor Andrew Jackson and it was Polk who also many historians believe engineered the American conflict with Mexico because of a Texas border dispute that he saw as an opportunity to seize more land for the United States and the United States had been trying for years to get Mexico to give up its western lands and to no avail. We tried to buy it, we tried to negotiate, and nothing would happen. The Texans claim that the southern boundary of Texas is the Rio Grande, but the Mexicans said it had never been the boundary of Texas. The Nueces River had been the boundary of Texas. So the United States sends troops into the area south of the Nueces once Texas is annexed, but Polk all along had been angling for a war. And what Polk had done is really begin to prepare his own 
speech declaring war in which he had a series of causes which were Mexican deaths and not even very convincing to much of anybody to try to get the war going when news arrives that in fact there's been a clash between American troops and Mexican troops. Americans have been killed. Polk rips up the old declaration, puts in a new one in which he says that Mexicans have invaded the United States and Americans have been killed on American soil. It will split the country again for a very long time. The North is very suspicious of this. The many Whigs are very much against it. Abraham Lincoln will first rise to political prominence through the spot resolution, demanding a Polk, where's the spot? You show me the spot on American soil where, in fact, American blood was shed, which the problem is it points out that it's not clearly American soil at all. It's disputed soil between Texas and, and Mexico. There were a lot of Mexicans at this point uh, in the Mexican military leaders who thought they had a, a pretty good shot at defeating the, the American army. And in point of fact, they should have. Now, I, I mean, separate the war into two places. If you take the West, where it was northern Mexico, New Mexico, California, there were very few Mexican troops there, and so they were, they were fairly defenseless. People in California, for example, had been clamoring since the 1820s for greater representation uh, in the Mexican Congress. Uh, so far away in Mexico City. And there had been lots of squabbles around what was the Mexican North. And for that reason, there was relatively little organized resistance to the arrival of those coming from the United States. There were revolts against the arrival of Kearney, General Kearney, who came into Santa Fe in 1846. Um, but in general, throughout the U.S. Southwest, the pattern is one of non-resistance to the arrival of the U.S. However, the war in central Mexico was quite a different matter. Most of the Mexican leaders felt they could defeat the American troops, and in point of fact, they should have been able to defeat it. As a matter of fact, the Mexicans fought quite bravely. The biggest problem were the generals. The Mexican generals were playing politics with each other, and as a result, they just wouldn't coordinate with each other. In fact, the main goal was coming out of this war with the political upper hand over opposing generals and so the American troops are able to defeat a much more a larger Mexican force. The takeover as it's now called of this area that was Mexican territory in this war of 1846 to 48 rely on the sense uh, in the United States of Mexico's inferiority in racial terms as it was then understood and in national terms Mexicans were thought to be dirty Mexicans were thought to be incapable of self-government Mexicans were thought to be people, uh, as much as anything, who were not taking proper care of this golden territory close to the Pacific. Now, it should be said that mixed in with these ideas about race and about Mexicans as a nationality are also ideas in the United States about capitalist expansion, the need to develop the economy of the United States. There is a need, for example, to expand to new markets so that the United States wants to get uh, a foothold in the Pacific in order to have greater access to Asia. This is a very important reason why people are talking about wanting to take California. You have growing numbers of farmers in the United States, in the East and in the Midwest, who are feeling pressed for land. And they see in the West lands which in their view are not being used at all, right? Because they're owned by Mexicans. It was really a war to get a piece of paper. Uh, they'd already grabbed off New Mexico, which they wanted. They'd already grabbed off California, which what the United States wanted. And now all they wanted was Mexico to sign a contract saying, look, it is now yours. So in a sense, a lot of American and Mexican blood was shed over a piece of paper. But the nature of what would be in that piece of paper was also being debated both in Mexico and the United States. In Mexico, how, how much uh, land are we willing to give? In the United States, you had people ranging from those who said, you know, at most let's take California and New Mexico to the all Mexican movement, uh, that group of senators who said, no, no, now that we've conquered central Mexico, let's take all of Mexico. If it weren't for the basic racism of particularly the southern senators who said, look, if we take Mexico, all these uh, brown-skinned people into the United States, uh, in a sense, the racial mixture of the Mexican population probably saved Mexico because enough Americans were opposed to the idea of bringing more Mexicans in. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the piece of paper that officially concludes the Mexican-American conflict, significantly alters the geographic and demographic profile of the United States. <laughs>
in Mexico, the issue was not just where do we draw the line, but what are the rights of Mexicans who remain above the line. So the option to, to obtain citizenship, I think, was one of the key elements. And it's my own thinking that given the kinds of pressure that Mexico was under, they didn't really have very many cards to play, that many of the Mexican negotiators really worked hard and went to bat for the Mexicans afuera, Mexicans who would suddenly find themselves outside of Mexico and try to defend their rights as well as they could. What we can say in terms of the demographic effects of the U.S.-Mexico war is that it had very startling effects uh, on the state of California. California goes from being, in 1846, a northern outpost of a Mexican nation which is struggling to define itself. By 1850, it's a new state. It's growing uh, more and more diverse as people from China, people from Ireland, people from Chile, also people from Mexico, and people from the United States begin to flood into the state in search of gold or riches, which they might find in the hills of the Sierra Nevada. This is really a startling development, a startling transformation, which would shape the history of California and the history of the West, arguably, for the next 150 years in many ways. But if you think about New Mexico here, in contrast to California, New Mexico was um, a center of Mexican power in the north of Mexico in the 1830s. It was an important northern trading site around Santa Fe in the 1830s and the early 1840s. So there was a community of people of Mexican descent who were living what looks something like middle class life. Traders, artists, artisans, and so forth. Now, how startling was the conquest of New Mexico for these people who considered themselves to be Mexican citizens? Well, less startling than for those living in California because there was no gold rush in New Mexico. There was not the same tidal wave of immigrants who descended into New Mexico in the 19th century. So the people who were living in New Mexico uh, remained the demographic majority. People who were in charge of the government, people who were in charge of many local businesses remained Mexican-American. The other key element was what do we do about the land? In the original treaty that was drawn up in Mexico City that went up to Congress through the U.S. Senate, the land remaining in Mexican hands would remain in Mexican hands as if it were still under Mexican law. In other words, if you got a Mexican land grant, it was a legitimate land grant, you got to keep your land. First Polk and then the Senate deleted the provisions from the treaty and instead inserted something that said that they, they could retain the land insofar as it conforms to U.S. law. Now that was the huge shift. The war is over and America has gained a vast new territory. But it has also acquired a set of troubling and divisive issues. A great chasm opened up between North and South a great chasm over what to do with the territories acquired in the Mexican-American War. David Wilmot, a Democrat from Pennsylvania as the Mexican War began, said, we love to think of America as being infinitely expansionist, but let's make a law that slavery cannot exist in those territories. And from that time onward, Northern and Southern people, Northern and Southern politicians in Congress were deeply at odds with each other. I can't stress that enough. It was incredibly dramatic. The presidential campaign of 1848 puts aside the controversy for a time as both Democrats and Whigs try to avoid the slavery question. When Polk decides not to run because of poor health, Democrats nominate Lewis Case, a dull aging party regular. The Whigs choose Zachary Taylor of Louisiana, hero of the Mexican War, but a man with no political experience. And in opposition, anti-slavery advocates organize a third party, the Free Soil Party, with Martin Van Buren as standard bearer. Although Taylor wins a narrow victory, Van Buren polls enough votes to carry ten Free Soilers to Congress on his coattails. Meanwhile, dramatic events are occurring in California. The discovery of gold, uh, for all practical purposes, uh, took place in January of 1848 in Northern California along the American River uh, on the land owned by a Swiss immigrant named John Sutter uh, who had come to this area um, on a Mexican land grant uh, to, uh, to develop a kind of a personal empire. 
The Mexicans had known that there's gold in California, but fairly minor deposits. The size of the deposits surprise everyone. And what happens next really surprises everyone. It is the first worldwide movement into the western part of North America. Before this, population had dribbled in from various sources. But now it's not just Americans from the East Coast, but it's Chinese, it's Peruvians, it's people from all over the world. The French are flowing in here. And um, California immediately takes off. When you think about the California gold rush, we think primarily about the famous 49ers. But uh, for a whole year, this area was mined of its gold uh, before these folks showed up. We forget about, in other words, the 48ers. The 48ers uh, were those people who were living in California at the time. Those were California, Spanish-speaking uh, natives, um, Indian peoples, but a remarkable number of people who flocked to California from around the Pacific Rim. California was far more accessible uh, to these people than it was to Americans on the on the Atlantic coast. And so for a full year, there was this uh, there was this very vigorous working of the land by these people before the 49ers even showed up. These 48ers do remarkably well, in part because many of them are experienced miners. When the 49ers showed up, uh, there began what we might call the second conquest of California. And now, all of a sudden, these folks come from the American East uh, who, who think that this land is theirs, and they find that this is country, which is, after all, the most valuable real estate on the planet Earth at this time, is occupied by these people that they consider foreigners. As a result of the transformations of the gold rush, Californios soon felt like they didn't belong in this place where their families had lived for years, if not decades. They were deprived of power, deprived of land, deprived of prestige, and soon most of these people, and particularly throughout Southern California, entered the wage labor force and became members of the local poor, the local working class. These are people who had been members of the local elite in the years prior to 1846. Quickly, towns are established where there had been none before. So a lot of people are crowding into an area that has never supported anything like that number of people up until that time. These people are coming from all over the place. They have very, very little in common, except the fact that they're, that they're all competing uh, with each other. The result of that is that there was this uh, tone of, uh, at least initially, of something close to chaos. There was this um, uh, unique uh, sort of raucous feel uh, to a mining town that, uh, that made it different, I think, from uh, most other gatherings or swarmings in American history. There was no concern with, uh, with building a fundamental structure of the town. The people wanted to make money and, and get out. And what are the chances that a miner will find gold, will strike it rich? In those earliest months, uh, that first year or so, it was possible to find uh, extraordinary amounts of gold, quite literally, uh, caught in these little pockets and niches of, uh, of creeks that you could pry it out with a knife or so. <laughs> that did happen, uh, but it was quite unusual. The thing to remember is that this was all a gamble. It was all a gamble. Uh, you could be an experienced miner, you could take all the right chances, and you could still lose and lose completely, end up with virtually nothing. In many ways, that is what characterizes the mining frontier and sets it apart from so much of American work before it. Most of these people had been farmers, or they had worked in small towns in mercantile operations. Uh, the, the rule of thumb was that if you paid attention, if you worked hard, uh, if you kept your budget right, uh, that you would succeed to a reasonable degree. Suddenly those rules just didn't apply. You might say that the people who made the most money in mining uh, were those who mined the miners. That is, those uh, people who were smart enough at the outset to realize that the real money was to be made in providing of those these people had to them and providing them at a very high price because after all this was a town that was isolated far from other centers of supply the customer had really no options could not go anyplace else and it was sort of you know <laughs> the free market gone rampant uh, and some of these people made a great deal of money indeed laborers are urgently needed to support this new enterprise even young men as far away as china look upon this as a golden opportunity and begin to emigrate in large numbers. The white immigrant working class people, primarily Irish American, but there are other groups as well, uh, felt directly threatened by Chinese miners. And um, the type of hostility that the Chinese miners, the laborers, encountered ranged from racial attacks, lynchings, burning them out of their houses, displacement, whatever it might involve. But on the other end of the spectrum, government forces also 
erected laws, especially in the state of California, that were targeting Chinese American uh, miners and laborers specifically so that they could not compete on an equal footing with white Euro-American immigrant miners, such as the foreign miners tax, exacting incredible financial burdens on the Chinese population specifically. And of course, they were restricted so far as where they could live, where they could set up business. The people who ran these operations had the luxury of being able to tap into this large army of, of exploitable laborers. And they were happy to do so because conditions in China were much, much worse because of colonial conditions that had been created by such superpowers at the time as uh, Great Britain. In such a setting, with a divergent population, a lack of supplies, and a raging epidemic of gold fever, how are laws enforced? How is order maintained? The gold camps were lawless in a way. In other ways, uh, they were remarkably law-abiding. These people had to be able to trust each other to a certain degree, which doesn't mean, of course, that theft didn't go on or the claim jumping didn't go on. It did mean, however, that the uh, level of that kind of crime was much lower than you might think, simply because these people had come to kind of a rough understanding. For all of their diversity of background, uh, for all of their conflicting interests, uh, they had in common uh, this need to be able to trust each other to a certain point. Uh, crimes against person uh, were, uh, interestingly, in, in some ways, less of a problem, you know, less of a concern uh, to the community than crimes against property. And so certain kinds of physical assault were unlikely to go punished. It was a pretty rough and tumble uh, way of life. The greatest crimes, I think, and the ones that are most often overlooked, were those that were committed uh, against the Indians. Uh, what, what occurred in California uh, between 1849 and 50 uh, and into the early 1860s uh, is one of the few examples in American history that I think could uh, can, can genuinely be called uh, genocide. Native American populations are occupying territories that the 49ers want, territory on which gold may exist, certainly, but more. Remember that to support the gold camps and to support this new economy, to support this very large new population, uh, a whole new economic infrastructure had to be built. Uh, there had to be farms, uh, there had to be ranches, uh, there had to be towns, there had to be uh, roads and transportation systems. All of this, uh, in turn, uh, disrupted the way of life of Indian peoples. It killed them indirectly by crippling their economies. And Indians very quickly began leaving the mines and the mining areas and then took a hostile position against these young uh, miners who were invading their lands and ruining their water, ruining the game and destroying their uh, their environments. This in turn escalated uh, into a series of assaults against Indian peoples, roundups, uh, herding them into what we would call today concentration camps. Outright Indian hunting organized groups of people who went out quite literally to kill Indians, to get rid of them, to exterminate them. It's very common to hunt down Indians and kill them to enslave their children. And I know of a, a newspaper incident in which a lawman found uh, a couple of uh, outlaws uh, pulling uh, a number of children along the, um, the roadway. The kids were all tied together and, and um, the uh, lawman asked what these men were doing. He said, well, we're taking these, these children in and we're going to take care of them. He said, well, where are their parents? Well, their parents are all dead. How do you know that they're dead? We killed them. That's how we know. And because the lawman was only one, and there were several of these uh, outlaws, they weren't, the, the lawman wasn't going to take them on. But he reported this incident to the newspaper. This was very common in California, as the population dipped from a roughly 1850 population of, uh, of 100,000 Indians to the 1860s, when we had roughly 30,000 Indians. And the population continued to decline after that. Indians were also forced to work in the mines, to work in the placer diggings, forced to work in all of these other sorts of enterprises, farming and ranching, uh, that were necessary to support this community. It was de facto slavery, a concerted effort uh, to destroy these Indian communities that, uh, that came very close to being successful. Considering its impact on California and the life of this country, the gold rush lasts only a short period of time. The greatest boom time in the California gold rush was between 1848 uh, and the early 1850s, 1852, 1853. By that time, the gold production was beginning to level off. But then, by 1858 and 59, other gold and silver discoveries are being made across the West. So, as California begins to, to taper off, uh, other areas begin to develop. 
The gold that comes in here is really a significant addition to, to the monetary supply of the United States. It also becomes a source of capital in which California will supply capital for mining ventures other places in the West. Because of the miners, it sets up agriculture to expand, cattle ranching to expand. Um, and all of this will not lead to the immediate benefits that Californians want, because there is going to be an economic decline, ironically, in the 1860s, 1870s. But looking back, California gets this advantage that it will never, ever lose. And it all dates back to the gold rush. The Unfinished Nation is a 52-part American history series. For more information about this program and accompanying materials, call 1-800-576-2988 or visit us online at www.intelecom.org.